So, you know, with cost as a non-factor, there's no lack of availability for the advancement of medical care for all people. And also, robotics is helping doctors do procedures remotely if necessary. Uh, better, safer, and with a faster recovery time for the patients. And I have links to videos that show this technology, how it works, and the doctors talking about it. So now let's look at abundance solution sets for quality of life needs. Shelter. There's a technology called contour crafting. Is anybody familiar with contour crafting? Okay. Now, it is developed by, it's in development right now by a professor at the University of Southern California. He already has a small-scale prototype version of it that works rather really well. Is anybody familiar with 3D printing? Yeah. Okay. Take that and put it on an industrial scale to where basically it's a self-erecting structure. Here's what you would do. You'd have your plot of land. The machine would drive up, erect itself, put itself together, and then draw out. It'll have the blueprints, the computerized blueprints in its computer-based system of how the house is supposed to look. It can build the house and wire it and plumb it, a 2,000 square foot house, in about 24 hours. All right? Shape memory alloy. Now, imagine you using the contour cracking technology in Haiti after everything fell to pieces. Being able to build a 2,000 square foot house in a day, put up 15 or 20 of these robots on a, a clear off the rubble, set these things up, and you're basically cookie-cutting houses <laughs> for people to get back in. And, and they're solid, robust, they're made out of advanced uh, concrete mesh materials. They're set up in a way where they would withstand future earthquakes. They can be engineered as such. The, the professor who is, is pioneering this technology has a lot of fantastic ideas, but what he lacks is money to do it. So he's having a hard time getting the funding to build the full-scale large-sized prototypes. Although NASA is interested because you can build a moon race that way too, especially if it's robotic. You don't have to worry about sending astronauts there. It can build a facility or at least a start of a facility first. Then you would send the astronauts to kind of detail it out after that. So gravity. Well, it'd be a little easier with the less gravity in, in most cases. So shape memory alloys. Uh, Anybody familiar with what a shape memory alloy is? Okay. Basically, if you had a spring made of this, it was set as a spring first, then it was cured. You could stretch that thing out, completely destroy it, bend it, crank it, and everything. Put a blow dryer up to it, and it would go right back to being a spring. The metal remembers what its initial shape was when it was cured in that shape. So imagine creating a dome or a structure facility that's cured in its final form, looking like a house or, a, or an establishment. But when you cool it or you pass elect electricity through it, it actually flattens out. So you stack up a whole bunch of those on a train system or whatever, and you ship it to wherever you need to ship it to. And then when you get there, you set these things up and you plug them in and they go <laughs> and they pop up. The technology exists. Clothing and other products, I go back to the 3D printing. You can do localized, you could do it in your own house if you had a 3D printer. If you saw online a piece of clothing that you liked and you had access to the material, the raw materials, you could go grab the materials, put it in the 3D printing set, or whatever the case may be, and press a button and it will build that for you, custom to your size. In fact, you could custom tailor every piece of clothing that you want that fits, everybody's body is different. We have standardized sizes now, small, medium, large, whatever. But imagine if you could custom tailor every piece of clothing you had all the way down to your t-shirts in your own house from whatever that you like. It also drastically reduces shipping needs if the only thing you're sending is the blueprint electronically to the computer that then prints up or basically sews together your clothes for you. Plus, you probably invent your own clothes. Make up your own stuff. You literally be your own stylist. You know what? I like a little of that, and I like a little of that, so I'm going to put it together and look, I'm my own, you know. But you need to ship tissues. Yeah, you would still, that would be the part that you would need to ship, but you could do that in mass. Uh, and. Well, 
no, you would hit only, the, you would go to the distribution center, like you would go to Joanne Fabrics or Linens and Things, in, or, or I don't know what you guys have in Europe, <laughs> but a fabric store and get the fabrics that you want, take it home and put it together for you. Education, internet-based education centers that are globally connected can educate humanity as never before possible in human history. We don't really have, it's, it's good, but we don't have to have human physical interaction to educate anymore. We can put computer centers in rural remote, remote parts of the world and still give them high quality access to advanced educations by experts in the field and world renowned professors in the form of video lectures. And as we all know, I'm sure, how many people have been using Skype while they've been here to talk to friends and loved ones and stuff? You can do conference calls in the same manner where the professor is on one end and the class of five to 10 or whatever is on the other end and they can still directly interact and ask questions. So there are no, there are no longer geographical limitations thanks to our communication capabilities to educate the world. And education is one of the most key steps to advancing human civilization anyway. Significantly more teachers might also be available since now their quality of life is not determined by income. How many people do you know, or just think of your personal circle or maybe extended circle, that would like to be a teacher, but they don't do it because it doesn't pay well enough? That they would, you know, they would really enjoy doing that, but they don't because it's just not equitable. Whereas in the resource-based economic system, there's no longer a restriction to be that person, to be that teacher. And another thing to consider is how many, how many people die every day from starvation? Imagine how many of those might be Einstein's, but we never knew it. How many minds have we lost that could have done amazing things? So education is a quality of life need that can easily be addressed through advanced communication systems in concert with everything else that I'm talking about. This is a holistic approach. This isn't a one-shot fix. So let's go to energy, clean energy. I hate burning stuff. It's ridiculous. It's the caveman approach <laughs> to energy system. You have terrestrial solar, space-based solar, wind, wave, tidal, geothermal, fuel cell, and ocean thermal energy conversion. There is, there is no one-stop shop save the world energy set where you only do one thing. Not yet, anyway. Not until we develop some amazing anti-gravity, super generative energy system. But for now, until we learn something new, these exist. And the only one that's in test phase would be the space-based solar power. And the analysis on that was actually done by NASA back in the 60s as a viable concept. But at the time, solar cell technology, the satellite would have been huge. It would have been almost impossible to launch. Well, now we're a lot better at getting our satellites smarter, smaller, smarter too. Smaller, smarter, and our, and our solar cell collection capability is a lot better as far as efficiency is concerned and weight. So now you can launch a satellite system, even if you do two or three launches and then build it like Legos up in orbit and make it larger, you can then beam raw energy in a safe microwave form that doesn't care if it's nighttime, cloudy, rainy, or whatever, to a receiving station. And it will, if you put that satellite in geosynchronous orbit above that s station, you have 24-7, 365 constant power, no matter what time of day it is. And no matter where you are in the world, it's portable. The satellite can repoint itself within a certain region to all the collection facilities that are in that zone of influence that it can reach. So all it's got to do is rotate its axis just a little bit and you can recharge the batteries in different cities in a circular pattern forever. <laughs> At least until the satellite needs maintenance and then you just send up the newest, best technology. But wind, wave, tidal, geothermal, all the rest of these do exist in some form or another. And they are getting better. Imagine how much better they would get if money wasn't an obstacle to the research and development of these advanced systems. If there weren't budget issues and concerns and restrictions, 
on making these technologies as robust as possible using the best materials possible that we have available. Yeah, but many of these developments, they need to be industrialized. And many people who do that if they can earn a lot of money. You have to, you have to change human, human nature, no? Not human nature. I don't believe in human nature. I believe in human behavior. Human behavior is a derivative of the environment that you live in. Sure. So I would say so th this is... This is a value change system. You have to change the way people think about the world, how they interact with each other, what's more important, money or people. Uh, right now we cultivate a system where it is better to be a greedy person and profit over somebody else in expense of somebody else. And that's what we promote and propagate in today's world. There are a few altruistic people who get money and then who turn it back. But we all know that the percentage of that is not adequate enough to provide sustainability. So it is a complete value set change. And it's not something that would happen overnight. It's going to happen in pockets. It's going to happen in small zones as people start to reduce their dependency on money and increase their efficiency of technical systems to provide for more people. So that's what the transition is. It's a new process. The world couldn't handle being dropped into a system like this, half the people who go schizophrenic and probably lose their minds. Because they wouldn't understand selfless self-interest. They have only been experiencing selfish self-interest for the dawn of time. Like I said when I was up on stage this morning, throughout the entire course of human history, 300,000 plus million, if you go all the way back to the Neanderthalic days, we've always lived in scarcity, and rival competition to survive as an animal, as a species. People forget that humans are animals. We just happen to be the most advanced animal, but we're still animals. So scarcity, not having enough, having to fight or compete to survive, has been a natural characteristic of mankind. I totally agree. It's a universal principle in the universe. Until the universe but, comes mean, up with ways. Quality, because otherwise we wouldn't have galaxies, we wouldn't have stars, but the galaxies and stars recycle themselves, do they not? Uh, to a certain extent, still there is no energy left over. Conservation of energy does not allow you to create nor destroy energy. Well, it will be, will be a cold soup of low energy, which is not able to, to build big structures. Well, maybe 20 billion years in the future, but that's a little bit beyond my time. Yes, it won't, it won't happen, but on the other hand, if there won't be inequality, then there will be no atoms, no molecules, and we wouldn't exist either. Okay, but is any of that conscious? I, I, don't, I don't say that human being must have behaved exactly like that, but I just want to attract your attention that it's a universal principle in the universe, otherwise it wouldn't exist. That doesn't mean that it can't gradually over time change human behavior. behavior. I don't say that. Okay. I just want to attract attention. Okay. So let's jump over to transportation, clean transportation. Again, I don't like setting things on fire to make them move. Ultra electric cars, robotic GPS driven cars, outdoor mobile sidewalks. I mean, we use them in the airport. We love them, right? You hop on that and you walk almost twice as fast. And you're still walking, but you got one person there carrying your luggage and you're here and you're ahead of them. Why don't we have that outside? We have the material capabilities to do that. So you would make it out of, you know, sun proof. You wouldn't make it out of rubber unless you had some way to cure it so that the sun wouldn't degrade the rubber and cause it to crack and break. You can make it out of carbon fiber material. You can make it out of something. You know, I'm not a material scientist, but I have a lot of belief in the fact that a material scientist team could come together and say, we know exactly what to make that out of so it can last 50 years and have mobile sidewalks. Our um, maglev train systems, uh, locally about a 400 mile range for maglev train systems, very similar to what China's doing. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of Asia is big in the magnetic levitation train system. I wish America was. Um, for some reason, we were really good at inventing amazing 